Okay. Welcome everyone. Um, Ole is going to be talking about cylindric partitions and character formulas for W algebra. Feel free to start whenever you're ready. Okay. Well, uh, I would say good morning, everyone. Although it's probably afternoon for for most of you, so it's uh, great to uh, give a long distance talk uh, this morning. Um, well, I see, of course, that uh, Shashank and Matthew are here, so um, they'll probably be familiar with most of what I'm going to say. But hopefully, for the rest of you, there's there's something new uh, uh, in my talk. Um, please feel free to interrupt me at any time if something is unclear. Um, in the first part of my talk, I'll try to sort of motivate a little bit where all of this comes from and and sort of necessarily I'll, I'll be somewhat vague and perhaps not define all of the terms that I'm using. But my, my hope really is that at least you get a sort of a rough idea of where this whole story is going. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing story that's very much uh, unfinished at the moment. Um, but uh, I thought it was at least important to put it in some sort of context. So as I said, the first talk of part of my talk is, is, is somewhat vague, but please feel free to, to interrupt me if anything is, is, is really too unclear. Okay, so, well, as I said, motivation. So for me and for many people in this area, it really starts a, a long, long time ago with a, a pair of, uh, well, are now famous Q-series identities. Um, and so if you, if you know about Q-series, although you would probably have seen this before, if you've never seen this before, then perhaps you don't know what's so special about this. So let's just say that these identities, so these are the famous Rogers Ramanujan identities, and I'll show you other identities of a similar nature. And what we're seeing here is on the left-hand side, so let me see. Can you see my pointer here or? We can, yes. Okay, so here on the left-hand side, there is a sum, and on the right-hand side, we see a product. And that's typically what we, we, we have in these types of identities. So there's a sum on the left, and there's a product on the, on the right. And, um, and of course, where we're going to go in this talk is that these identities uh, are well, very much related to, to algebra and representation theory, but of course, as early as 1894, not much of that was around, and these were just some beautiful identities first discovered by Rogers, and uh, essentially doing really work just in, in Q-series. Um, and it took a long time. So I should maybe go back to these identities. It's, it's not the case, so I'm going to make a big jump of about 80 years since the work of, of Rogers. And it's certainly true that in the meantime, in the area of Q-series, a lot more was done on identities of this time. And in particular, we have combinatorial interpretations in terms of integer partitions. And I'll talk about partitions a little bit more later in the talk. Uh, there've been various generalizations and so on. But it again, it all stayed within the field of Q-series or special functions and I think the really exciting development for hopefully for the people present today uh, happened much, much later when it was realized that perhaps, I mean, to me, this is really the natural setting of, of identities of this type is the representation theory of things like infinite dimensional Lie algebras and various other things that are closely related to that. And so let's, sort of see how this comes about. And again, what I'm telling you here, is certainly not the only way to interpret these identities in terms of representation theory, but this was the, the first uh, way they were related to representation theory. So I take the essentially just affine SLR. So the, I guess one of the simplest affine Lie algebras, and I hope everyone is familiar with affine Lie algebras. If you're not, it's just an important class of Lie algebras that are infinite dimensional. And if we study uh, the standard modules of these algebras, so the standard modules, they are exam well, they're highest weight modules. So they're indexed by an object that we call the highest weight and that essentially fix completely fixes the module. And if you compute the character of the, those standard modules and 
for convenience, we slightly normalize this character so that it essentially becomes a Laurent polynomial in these formal exponentials in the uh, negatives of the simple roots of the F and V algebra. So if we take uh, these characters and we apply what is called principal specialization. So what we do is we take this, I guess, Laurent series that is in, in well, it has R variables and we set all of these variables to be the same. So in other words, each of these formal exponentials, we just set them equal to Q. So now what we get is simply a formal power series in a single variable. I shouldn't really have set Laurent series. I should really have set a formal power series in, in R variables. And so now we get a formal power series in just a single variable Q. And so this procedure of principal specialization that might just come out if you haven't seen that before, it's just, well, why are you doing this? But it's actually quite natural in terms of the representation theory as well. It's a very natural sort of grading that you can put on this, on this module. In any case, if you do that and you slightly normalize your principally specialized character by dividing it by the principally specialized character of a, what we call level one module, then we get an object, which I denote here with this thing on the left-hand side and the notation will hopefully become clear in a moment. But if we do that, then it turns out, well, as I'll show, I need to introduce some notation, but effectively this object here on the left for suitable modules are precisely going to be the Rogers Ramanuj in Q series. Okay, so I'll explain that a little bit in a little bit more detail. So again, let me emphasize what have we done? We've taken a character of a standard module, which is a very important class of representations. We principally specialize these characters so that now we have a Q series. And then finally, we slightly modify this by normalizing this. And it may appear that I'm taking the ratio of two um, formal power series in Q. And it may not be clear that this is again a formal power series, but all these series start with one and then higher order terms. So indeed I can interpret this again as a formal power series. And, and again, it may not be immediately clear perhaps that the coefficients are integers, but, but everything is fine. <laughs> so let's just put these little technical details aside. So this formal power series turns out to be, if you take the correct modules, precisely the rogers ramanujan and Q series. So, um, okay, so for that, I need a little bit of notation. So the standard notation for these products, because there will be a lot of products in this talk, is you, you, we use this Q shifted factorial. So A with a subscript N is just a product of A uh, of, of N uh, monomials or binomials, I should say here. So one minus A, and then you just, the next term is one minus A times Q and so on, all the way to one minus A two. And in fact, my, my count is off here. This should have been an N minus one here. So uh, this is unfortunately not quite correct, but the, anyway, you get the structure. <laughs> and we also do, for some shorthand notation, I introduce a, effectively a Jacobi theta function, which is just a product of two of these Q-shifted factorials with an infinite index. So these are infinite products here, which have a nice symmetry. If I replace A by Q over A, it stays invariant. Okay. And so now if I parameterize my weights that were indexing these standard modules in terms of integer partitions, so an integer partition is just a sequence of integers that is weakly decreasing and they're all non-negative. So if I take a partition and I parameterize my uh, high or my highest weight in this highest weight module. And so because mu, uh, mu one is greater or equal to mu two, so this coefficient of lambda one here, this lambda one is just the first fundamental weight is, is clearly going to be non-negative. And that is true for all of these coefficients. And also this first one, because I demand that uh, mu one minus mu r, so the first part minus the last one, that this is less than or equal to some integer d. So this here is also non-negative. 
So all of these coefficients of the fundamental weights, they are non-negative, and that precisely gives me a what we call a dominant integral weight. And as is known in the theory, the dominant integral weight, they really uh, parameterize all of the irreducible representations or of the highest weight uh, or standard modules, I should say. And if I take the sum of all of these coefficients of these various uh, fundamental weights, it precisely adds up to D, and that we call that the level of the representation. And in general, if I increase the level, things become more complicated. So low level modules are sort of easy, higher level modules are a lot harder to understand. And again, that is sort of standard stuff in, in representation theory. Okay, so now the um, if we take the what is known as the Lepofsky numerator formula, so that's essentially a formula for the principally specialized characters of standard modules, and it's not just for affine SLR. You can take any arbitrary symmetrizable catch Moody Lie algebra. We only need type A here and untwisted type A. All of our story will only deal with just the standard affine SLR. But if you take that formula, which is a very general and beautiful formula, you restrict it to this particular case, and we adopt this parameterization of the highest weight indexing the module, then you can see that you precisely get a, well, this, this big expression here is just an infinite product because as I mentioned earlier, these theta functions are just infinite products. And then there's a, some more infinite products here out at the front. And again, you see the D here, this level showing up, R that's, that's going to be the rank for us. And, and this is it. So if you know this formula, and, and of course, Lepofsky certainly did, and Lepofsky and Milner did, and now they just realized if I restrict this to R being equal to two, so rank two, so that's just F on SL2, and I take the level to be equal to three, so D is equal to three, well, then there's effectively only two representations. And if you take those, these characters here, you precisely get the rogers ramanujan products. So these were precisely, so if I go back to, well, three pages, if you hear again, you have the right-hand side of these rogers ramanujan identities. We now understand that what they are, they're roughly speaking, principally specialized characters of, well, of affine SL2, and some low level modules. And I said, it's not quite principally specialized because we did this funny normalization here. And of course that's quite important. Okay, so it's not the principally specialized character itself because we need to divide by the character of a level, level one module. Okay, so that's what they observed. So that was really the first, and I think this was 1978 or something like that, this was published. So. Uh, quite a bit late, so indeed, I mean, 80 years later, right, then, then, then uh, Rogers published his paper. So it's quite remarkable that it took that long to really finally find a good home for the Rogers Romanogen identities. So that was a really big, uh, big breakthrough. And, and so I'll say a little bit more about that. So what this really meant for, well, for lots of things. So of course, so now we understand the uh, product side of the rogers ramanujan identities. And then of course, we have to ask the question, and this is certainly what, what people did at the time, so Lepofsky and Wilson in particular did, well, what about the sum side? Do we understand this in terms of representation theory as well, right? So can we understand the rogers ramanujan identities purely from the point of view of representation theory? That's really the question. And, and it turns out that this is indeed possible because they, okay, so they uh, essentially what they, what it led them to discover is this principal Heisenberg, Heisenberg subalgebra, which I write here with a little s because that's, I think, the notation that they used of SL, um, affine SL2. And they showed that this normalized principally specialized character is precisely the character of what they call the vacuum space 
of highest weight vectors of our original module with respect to this Heisenberg subalgebra. So they really interpreted this normalized principally specialized character as a character itself of something slightly different. So of the, essentially character as a set of what they call this vacuum space. Um, as part of that story, so I said it also led, but I mean, this was of course all intertwined. I mean, this was part of what the work they did. It led them to um, what we now, I guess, know as, as Z algebras. And, and, and these algebras have been incredibly important, right, in, in, the, in the theory and the development of vertex operator algebras. So um, it certainly didn't just stay within the little realm of, of Rogers Ramanujan identities. The kind of structures that were developed as part of this story has, have had huge influence in, 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 in a much broader, uh, I guess, range of applications in, in representation theory and, and in algebra. So it really was was very, very important. And, and moreover, the, this work was then extended to include other Rogers Ramanujan type identities. So as I already mentioned, if you increase the level, you get more complicated representations. And, and in the 80 years between Rogers work and, and the work of Lepofsky and Wilson, many other Rogers Ramanujan identities were discovered, sort of more complicated ones that we now understand in terms of in exactly the same way, but now corresponding to higher level standard modules of SL2, for example. And so these are the Andrews Gordon identities and the Bressouts, uh, even modular analogs. So they're again, very famous in the theory of, of Q series and partition theory. And, and they again fit in, in exactly the same way um, in terms of the representation theory of, um, of affine SL2. So in case you've never seen them and the actual structure of these identities is not so important, but what you see, so forget about this first line here, you can see the second line in the middle. So this is the sum side of the Andrews Gordon Bressoud identities. So now it's a multi-sum and the structure is not so important. So if you're not familiar looking at these expressions, it just looks like a big mess, but that doesn't really matter. Again, it's a sum that's equal to a product. And again, it's very easy to recognize the product using the uh, numerator formula for, by Lepofsky as, as precisely corresponding to the character again of a vacuum uh, space, but now corresponding to a higher level representation. So now this representation is level 2K plus tau, where tau is zero or one, so we have even or odd moduli respect, depending on whether tau is one. That was discovered first, that's Andrews Gordon, and then later Brasut did the case tau is zero. Okay, so let's say a little bit more about this Z algebras and really what the Rogers Ramanujan identities did for representation theory. Because it may at this point appear that perhaps representation theorists gave an interpretation of the Rogers Ramanujan identities. But so what? But well, apart from the fact, of course, that I said it led to the discovery of a number of important structures, the story is really it's gone both ways. So the the Q series identities really informed the representation theory. And I think that is the sort of one of the important messages that even if you don't care about Q series, the Q series really tell you things that otherwise we wouldn't know. So, so let's have a somewhat closer look at, at what's happening. So it's, as I said, it's, it's really related to the story of trying to find bases for these. Well, in this case, right, they, we were talking about these vacuum spaces. So again, they're indexed still by this uh, dominant weight. And if we want to compute its character, which is, is what we want, um, well, we, we, right, we need to find the spanning set for that space. And we need to find, of course, in, in fact, we need to re reduce that to find in a proper basis and then we can compute the character. That's roughly how things work. Now, it turns out that this vacuum space, there exists a filtration 
So that's what I've written here. And I've just done this in the example of the first Rogers Ramanujan identity, but this is, I think on the next page, I show this in the more general setting. So there exists a certain filtration. And if I take the nth factor here and I mod out the, the previous one, well, that space, it's spanned. Um, and in fact, it's, it's, it's spanned by, so you take the highest weight vector of your original module. So that's the V here. And you start acting with these operators, which are really, right, they belong to the Z algebra of Lepofsky and Wilson. And if you look at what is indexing these, so these, these Z algebra in general, you have these Z sub I, I wrote this here, where I is just any integer. But it turns out that this quotient here, it's really spanned by, you only need these negative modes and it's span, and I index them by mu one, mu two, up to a mu n, where these mu i's, well, they precisely form a partition, an integer partition again of length exactly n, and then there is this curious condition that if you take two consecutive parts of your partition, you want them to differ by, well, more, essentially at least two, right? So mu i minus mu i plus one must be greater or equal to two. For a normal partition, it's okay for mu i and mu i plus one, for example, to be equal or just differ by one. But here we have a difference two condition. And in fact, the space, um, this difference two condition partitions, they were well known in the theory of partitions. And it was well known in the theory of partitions that this is precisely the set of partitions that if you compute its generating function, you get the sum side of the Rogers Ramanujan identities. And so that's what I sort of indicate at the bottom of the page. If you now compute the character then of, of this space here, you precisely get the sum end of the Rogers Ramanujan identities. And now if you want to get the full space, you need to sum over n. And, and that precisely gives you the full character of the vacuum space. Okay, so, and the same, applies in the case of Andrews Gordon. So here I do it more generally. Again, we have a filtration of this vacuum space. Now it's a more complicated vacuum space of a, I, of a level 2K plus one. I exclude the breast suitcase because there's a slight modification you have to make. And I didn't want this slide to look technical, but you can do exactly the same for breast suit and almost everything on this page stays the same. But in any case, just for simplicity, I've taken the odd moduli cases here. And we have the same story. The only difference is now that now we, that you don't look at mu i minus mu i plus one, but you look at mu i minus mu i plus k. So you sort of look at the difference of two parts in your partition a distance k apart. And again, that must be greater or equal to two. And then there's in total, there's, well, I guess k plus one different modules and how does that, and they're indexed by A, and how does that A enter? That just tells you how many ones your partition can have. So it can have at most A uh, parts equal to one. And again, if you compute the, it, well, I should say, again, it was already known. This is how the Gordon first discovered his identities. If you try to compute the generating function of this set of partitions here, with now this difference two condition at distance K, that was precisely what gave you the Gordon partitions. And so we know, for example, that we exactly get this sum side of the Andrews Gordon identities. Again, there's a restriction here where these n1 up to nk are equal to n, which is the n here that is determining this quotient. Now, if I sum over this little n here, I get the full character as before. But in this case, initially, so really what we want, I said, well, this space here spanned, but of course you also want to make sure that it's right, that you actually have a proper basis for that space. So you need a minimal spanning set if you wish. <laughs> and in initially, for example, it wasn't clear from the representation theory that this was true, but you could use the 
Andrew's Gordon identities to show that you were not, uh, I guess, uh, getting the wrong count because this is the sum you would get and that sum is equal to the product. And that product we already knew that was precisely by Lepofsky's numerator formula, it would give you the correct character. So therefore we knew that indeed we were dealing with the basis. So it could actually help you to determine that what you think is a basis is indeed a basis. And later, of course, people remove the need to, to need the Rogers or the Andrews Gordon identities, but initially it really helped to inform what would be a basis of, of these vacuum phases or of these various subspaces in this filtration and so on. So, um, so in general, if you have these Q series identities, it can really tell you right what these what good basis for your modules are. Um, so that's why even if you don't care about Q series, you should perhaps care a little bit because it can actually help you understand the structure of these modules. Okay. All right, I should say, because in my title originally and later, I, I perhaps slightly regretted that, but nonetheless, I had W algebras in my title because you can rephrase everything I've said so far it's just an alternative interpretation of the Rogers Ramanujan and also the Andrews Gordon identities, where now we say they're 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 characters of the Fiorazoro algebra. Okay, so the Fiorazoro algebra, as probably most of you will know, it's just right, the generators are some L L subscript n's where n runs over all of the integers, and we also have a C that's a central element, and these are the essential commutation relation. And of course, L N and C they well, commute because C is in the center. And again, you can look at representations of the Fiorazoro algebra. And if you look at representations where the central charge where C takes, well, these particular values, and there's also something, a, a conformal weight, which again is indexed by little a, which runs between zero and K just as before, then the characters of the Fiorazoro algebra, they are the same as these characters of these vacuum spaces. So alternatively, you could say that everything we've done so far is really computing characters of the Fiorazoro algebra. And why it's good to have this second interpretation, because later I'm going to talk about cylindric partitions. And it turns out the Fiorazoro algebra, there's a lot of other representations as well. So this is not the Right, these are not all of the, in general, the Fiorazoro algebra, if we're looking at, well, there's what is known as the minimal series, they're indexed by two integers, P and P prime. And, and so, whereas here, it's only indexed, well, by a single integer K. So this is a one parameter subfamily of a much larger family of representations of the Fiorazoro algebra. And once we go to the, the cylindric partition picture, um, we don't just get these vacuum, the characters of these vacuum spaces, but we get more generally, we get the characters of the Fiorazoro for indexed by P and P prime. Okay, so um, even though I'm going to purely focus on this one parameter subfamily, even later in my talk, uh, I think I'll, I'll mention at least briefly that uh, from the point of view where I'm going to look at this problem next, uh, perhaps this W algebra picture is the right one because uh, everything is contained even in this, in this broader picture. But okay, that's, that's probably all I, I say about this for now. And, and so this is really now my, I guess, the end of my, my introduction and my motivating question. What are the analogs of the previous story if rather than looking at F and SL2, we look at F and SLR? Or rather than looking at the Fiorosoro algebra, we look at WR. W2 is the Fiorosoro algebra. So that's a very natural question. And given that, that everything I've, I've told you has been around for so long, it's really surprising that as soon as we increase the rank, well, so here's the sort of short answer we know surprisingly little. So it's such a beautiful picture that exists for F on SL2. And why is it taking so long for us to, to lift this to F on SLR, right? That seems strange, but fortunately there's been some progress very, very recently. So really we're talking the last 
decade or so. So, and, and mostly affine SO3, I should say. So it's still, uh, there's still a lot remains to be done. Okay. So, well, what was known? So as I said, I'm going to bring cylindrical partitions into the picture. So the question is, well, what was known before cylindrical partition entered the story? And very, very little. So we have in all of this picture, there is something that's called level rank duality. So if you in flip the rank and the level, then things essentially stay the same. So for free, you get some results for higher rank, but then the level is restricted to two. And that's really, so, okay, that's somewhat boring. And we really want to go beyond the sort of the trivial stuff that you get for free. Well, then, I guess the only results known and were a result for level four and affine SL3. So that was work I did with George Andrews and Anna Schilling, well, more than 20 years ago now. And so here you see, this is just an example of, again, the sum is equal to a product identity, but now this corresponds to affine SL3. And so the, the sum is a double sum and the most important, again, the details are not so important, but you should see there's some structure to it because this quadratic form here in the exponent of Q, well, if you know the Cartan matrix of SO3, you probably recognize why you get N squared minus NM plus M squared. Okay, so there is some, uh, some Lie algebraic structure in this. And then, okay, there's some other junk in this sum end and it's again equal to a product. And again, it corresponds to a vacuum, the character of a vacuum space. But that was about it that was known. And certainly the whole, um, in terms of, well, how does this relate to, for example, bases of vacuum spaces of level four for affine SL3? So there's four of these spaces. Well, no one has really looked at that yet, or no one's really said anything meaningful about that. So this entire Lepofsky-Wilson type story is completely non-existent yet. But we do now have the Q-series identities and you would expect that these identities know something about an, a suitable basis for, for these spaces, but uh, remains to be done. Okay, so now well, I should uh, move on a little bit because otherwise I'm running out of time. So. What, how do cylindric partitions help? So, okay, well, I mentioned partitions already a few times. So just a quick recap. So a partition is just, a, as I said, a weakly decreasing sequence of non-negative integers. And I like to think of a partition just, I draw this as a diagram on the page. So, so here, this is the partition five, three, two, two, and one. Okay. So that's a, an integer partition. And of course, Euler already studied integer partitions and we know what the generating function is, for example. So if I compute the, so the absolute value of lambda, that's just the size of the partition. I can also keep track of the maximum. So the largest part. So in this example, that would be five. And again, you see products showing up. Okay, so that's the simplest case of just integer partitions. And I should say that you still get nice products if you restrict yourself to partitions contained in a, in a rectangle. So here I've, I've given you an example of a partition that's contained in a box of dimensions A times B. And that precisely, if you compute the generating function of integer partitions contained in a box, you precisely get what we know uh, called the Q binomial uh, coefficients or Gaussian polynomial. So it's actually a polynomial and that's what I used in this expression here. I mean, I hadn't explained what that was for this affine SL3 uh, character here. So again, this is just a positive polynomial in Q. Okay, so that's the one dimensional case. So, well, roughly around the time that Rogers in fact did his work, McMahon introduced higher dimensional analogs of integer partitions. And, and by far the most interesting case is just the, what we now know as plane partitions rather than going even higher in dimension that doesn't have a lot of structure. So now you take a double array and again, you have weakly decreasing conditions. So this top left entry is the, is the 
the greatest. And if you go right or if you go down, you need to weakly decrease. And you sum up all of these entries. And, and if that sums up to n, we say we have a plain partition of n. Of course, it's much easier to just look at an example. So it's really what it is, it's just a filling of a, I guess, a, the diagram of an, an ordinary partition with numbers that are weakly decreasing if you go right and you go down. And the way you should think of this is now, well, it's just stacking of unit cubes. So this is really the proper, I guess, three-dimensional picture of a plane partition. And, and the number being partitioned is just, if these cubes are just unit cubes, it's just the volume of that object. Okay, so just like with ordinary partitions, we saw this as a picture like this. So of course the natural higher dimensional analog is rather than stacking unit squares is you're stacking unit cubes. And that's what we're doing here. Okay. And again, you can compute a generating function. And once again, it's a nice infinite product. So great. So very similar to with ordinary partitions. Again, we get nice products. So we always get nice products in, in, in this story. So that's great. All right. So that's that's the plane partitions. Again you can consider constrain this to, to a box. So if you put a plane partition in a box, now of course you have three dimensions, A, B, and C, it still gives you a nice product. And this was already discovered by McMahon. I think this is a beautiful formula. It's one of my favorite formulas in, in sort of combinatorics. And of course, if C is equal to one, so if the height can only be one, and effectively you only have a single layer. So you're just looking at partitions contained in now in a rectangle. And it's easy to see if C is equal to one, you precisely get the Q binomial coefficient back. So this is sort of a generalized Q binomial, a three-dimensional analog of a Q binomial coefficient if you want to. Okay, so that's all nice. So, well, we need a little bit more. So then again, a very big jump right, took more than 100 years after McMahon to uh, get to essentially an affine analog of plane partitions, which we now call cylindric partitions. And so that was done by Gessler and Katzenthaler. And here you see a picture of a cylindric partition. So let me try to explain what it is. So we take a ordinary plane partition, but in fact, we take a skew plane partition. So if you look at this picture, or maybe look at the picture on the right, forget about these black letters or numbers here at the top. So this is looks like a plain partition, but I've cut out a top left corner here. So this is really a skew analog of a plain partition. And it will become clear later why that's a good thing to do. And now what we're gonna do is we take this skew plain partition and essentially we take the final row and we put it back on top but we shift it with a distance D to the right. So this nine, eight, five, five, I put this on top, but I shift it to the right. And now I insisted again that everything is weakly decreasing. And so we call that a cylindrical partition because equivalently you can think of this as your, you wrap your, your skew plane partition uh, around the, a cylinder. And so R here is going to be the number of rows before I start repeating myself. And D is this shift. So this distance, so if effectively this here is R and this distance here is D. Okay, and these are precisely going to be the R, the rank that we saw in the F and Lie algebras and D is going to be the level. All right. And we talk about a profile of a cylindric partition and the profile is just these offsets. So this is two here, then another two, then a zero and then a one. Okay, so that's the profile of the cylindric partition. That's how the different rows are shifted relative to each other. And because we want this picture to have full sort of cyclic symmetry, it was really natural to take a skew um, plane partition, because now it really doesn't matter that we say this is the first row, the second row, the third row, and the fourth row. If you think of this as wrapped around the cylinder, you can take any of these rows as your first, right? So it has complete cyclic symmetry, which is, of course, what we want, because ultimately we want to relate this to affine SLR. And if you know the Dinkin diagram, right, this has cyclic symmetry. So that's what we need. 
Okay. Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. All right, so again, uh, one can compute the generating function in closed form if you put this in a box. Now, what does it mean putting this in a box? So this is here is a picture of a cylindric partition. Okay, so this is the skew object and then I start cycling this. Now, of course, it in, in, in two direct, I mean, in these directions, it's infinite, right? I can't put this in a box, but I can put a restriction on the maximal height. So that is sort of the, it's not really boxed. It's, there's only one dimension left where I can properly restrict this. So if we do that, and so that's here, this max, the maximum part, we say less than or equal to H, and then get, guess on Katzenthaler founder, I mean, this is no longer a product. So maybe you're disappointed because finally we no longer have a product, but it still has good structure because we see a sum here over a lattice and then the determinant, that's of course a sum over the symmetric group. Effectively, this is just a sum over the F1 wild group of type A, okay? And, and what I've done here is this profile, I've parameterized this and this parameterization is very similar to the parameterization that I had earlier of my highest weights that were indexing my, my representations of affine SLR. So it's effectively the same, um, same parameterization. And now, okay, I didn't have a product, but the good news is if I sent this H to infinity, then I can use the McDonald's identity. Then this really precisely becomes the McDonald identity or the wildcats denominator formula of type A, and you actually do get a product. And it's precisely the same thing. I get precisely the character of these vacuum spaces. Well, not precisely, there is one little factor, but it's almost that. So in other words, the generating function of cylindric partitions give you up to a simple infinite factor it gives you the characters of these vacuum spaces. Well, that's quite remarkable. Um, and of course, equivalently, if I now go to these W algebras and I fix the central charge, so now I have a one, if I think of R being fixed and I let D sort of the level, I let that run. So this would be a one parameter family because this R is really the R of the WR. Then, uh, and again, I, I fix the conformal weight. It's the same story because these two things, this here and that thing are, are exactly the same. But if you want, as I mentioned earlier, if you want the other characters of the W algebra, you certainly can. You just need to slightly broaden your class of cylindric partitions. I'm not really going to talk about those, but rather than have weakly decreasing conditions, you have a little offset in how you do this. So there must be the, you compare sort of consecutive parts in your cylindric partition, but then you add some integers to it in your inequalities. Then, um, so uh, Gessel and Kattenthaler call this alpha beta cylindric partitions. Then you, precisely can get W algebra. So now again, the minimal series of that is indexed by P and P prime. And the ordinary cylindric partition correspond to P is equal to R and P prime equal to D plus R. Now this D plus R is always fixed, but this R, you can change this if you play around with these alphas and betas and you get the other values of P. Um, but if alphas and betas are both zero, then you get the case that I've been considering so far. But it's good to realize that these uh, cylindric partitions don't just give you the characters of the vacuum spaces, they really give you the characters of, of a lot more. If you are interested in the complete minimal series of these W algebras, you get them as well, okay? So, so in that sense, perhaps that is the, the, the correct interpretation rather than just restricting oneself to these uh, vacuum spaces, but okay. Well, so now the question is, of course, well, can we, so I restrict myself again now to the vacuum space case rather than to the full W algebra case, but you can ask exactly the same question, but I mean, I, I, it's in here, WR, but I'm really not going to say much about that beyond the special, this one parameter subfamily. So can we compute the characters using cylindric partitions, right? I mean, does it help? 
to know about this connection here. So does it help to have this formula here that if you want to compute the character, well, you should just compute the generating function of cylindric partitions. Well, it turns out it does help um, because if we take cylindric partitions with a fixed profile and we bring in a second variable Z, which keeps track of the maximum part of my cylindric partitions. So now we have a two variable generating function. So this is a very natural statistic in terms of cylindric partitions. And of course, in terms of representation theory, it was, uh, it was not so natural to have this, but if you look at the combinatorics of cylindric partitions, this immediately presents itself. That you should look at the two variable generating function. And the point is that it turns out that this two variable generating function satisfies really nice uh, functional equations. And, and they give you access to actually computing these things. And, and so in view of the time, perhaps I shouldn't give you the details, but essentially what you're gonna do is you're gonna look at these. So here's a cylindric partition. You're going to look at the collection of what we call corner squares. So those squares that you're going to, that you see that form a little corner on the left, and you're going to relate the generating function of such cylindric partition with if you remove corner squares. Now, if you remove a corner square, you don't change the level because that's the total offset, but you, you change effectively the, the, if you wish, you change the highest weight. So you're within the same level, there's a, a whole, there's a range of, right? There's a number of, of representations and it essentially takes you from one representation to the next. And so you can relate these. So if it introduces variable Z, effectively what you're doing is you're relating the characters of different modules. And, and that turns out to be very powerful. So, um, so here, as I said, this is these functional equations. It looks a little bit complicated. So let's not worry about it. There's just a system of equations that we can now try to solve. And it's, it gives you the set of generating functions of all cylindric partitions with a given profile that correspond to the same level. And of course the rank, again, we think of this as fixed. So let's do a trivial example. If I take the rank to be equal to one, well, that really corresponds to uh, fine as all one, right? There's nothing here, but by level rank duality, it's the same as saying that the level is one. And remember that we were computing vacuum characters of vacuum spaces which was a character of a standard module principally specialized divided by a level one character. So that should give us one because we had normalized this. Well, so we, in this case, this functional equation just trivializes. It doesn't depend on D at all on the level and you can easily solve it and it gives you Euler. So if you said Z is equal to one, it just gives you this infinite factor which was, oops, I shouldn't do that. That was precisely this infinite factor. So in other words, this thing here is just one. And, and so, well, as it should. Okay, so in this trivial case, we immediately get what we should. So that's reassuring. What about R is two? So now we look at F on SL two. So of course, there's nothing new here. We already understand this case. And I look at D is three, so level three. Well, indeed, I get back the Rogers Ramanujan functions, but indeed in the sum form. And again, I get this infinite product in front, which if I said Z is equal to one, so I just remove that. And then this thing is precisely the character of the vacuum space. So again, we, we get these results in a very easy way using these functional equations. Well, unfortunately, so now you can say, well, okay, that looks really good. Let's just solve these equations completely generally for all rank and all levels and be done with the whole problem. Well, that becomes hard. So we've made progress with affine SL3, but beyond that, it's so far, it's been, no one's been really successful. So, but here's an example. This is, corresponds to affine SL3. And this is what Cortil and Welsh did. So this is just one particular example. But if you take Z is equal to one and you remove this factor in front, this is precisely the character of the vacuum space that 
Andrews, Schilling and myself computed, well, a little bit more than 20 years ago. So now we get that in a very easy manner uh, some 20 years later. And so that's promising. Um, so we should now go beyond uh, level four and see if we can make progress with some higher levels as well. And that is possible. So I'm just going to flash you up some very quickly. So the next level one can consider. So here you can see two plus two plus one. So this is level five. And so this is, as you can see, it's extremely recent. One can again solve this system of equations. We said Z is equal to one. That gives you the character of the vacuum space. Well, you get this precisely this, this factor in front that you just remove. And in other words, this here is a sum side for a Rogers Ramanujan identity related to this level five vacuum uh, space of affine SO3. And well, the question is, well, can you relate this sum and in some way to a suitable basis for that module, right? So again, that's an open question. Even in the level four case, that question hasn't been answered. Well, here we can add this to the question. And similarly, we can do here, well, this is actually an even lower level, level three. Levels that are divisible by three are a little bit harder. <laughs> and I won't really go into why that is, but again, you can see this is a very recent result, 2022. So there's so we now start sort of special cases. We start to find these sums forms that are equal, of course, to the products. Well, now I should really come to, I guess, the work that uh, Shashank and, and Matthew have done because they used all of these special cases and a bunch of other results to come up with a very, very general conjecture. Essentially, I mean, to me, that conjecture really conjectures everything for affine SO3, uh, for arbitrary levels. It doesn't quite cover all of the characters, but let me not go into that. It covers almost everything, certainly everything that we consider to be nice. So, uh, so that's quite remarkable. So that's really, that's really big progress because now we have formulas essentially for all levels for affine SO3. And, um, I'm not going to give you their full, well, I should say this is a conjectural. I'm not giving the full set of conjectures. So I, I take Z is equal to one because it simplifies a little bit. And I only take, it really depends. Now the formulas depend on the congruence class modulo three. I already told you that if you're divisible by three then things are a little bit more complicated. So I'm just fixing here, congruence class one modulo three. And this is, is their conjecture. Effectively, what their conjecture says for the characters of the uh, vacuum spaces now of affine SO3. So now these are indexed by two integers, A and B. K is fixed, that's sort of, so this is level three, K plus one. And you can see that it's a, a multi-sum where now I'm summing over a pair of partitions of length at most k, and then there's some complicated expression. But it has some structure. So if, again, this looks like a mess if you've never seen these things before, but you can see these quadratic exponents, they have the structure of the Cartan matrix of SO3, for example. So these are good expressions. Moreover, this sum and, even though you see a minus sign here, but it, it, it it, this sum and is manifestly positive, which is again, a good thing. If you want a combinatorial basis of your, or your module, that's certainly what you insist on. So everything is good about this. The only thing that is a slight problem, and I put this in red here, you have this factor here on the left-hand side that really we don't want. So that's a little bit of a unfortunate that it's there. But other than that, I mean, it's a remarkable formula. Um, so I'm very glad that, uh, yeah, Shashank and Matthew managed to conjecture this uh, because very recently I've proven that this is true for all moduli. So that's great. But of course, that's still, I mean, this doesn't quite give us character formulas for the thing that we want because if I remove these factors, I put it on the other side, I'm, I'm multiplying by this infinite, this Q infinity thing, and we did, that has minus signs. So then the right-hand side is no longer manifestly positive. 
And so it doesn't help us if we want to, for example, construct bases. This is really not the right expression yet. From the point of view, cylindric partitions, this is perfectly fine because this is just a generating function of cylindric partitions. And so that is a combinatorial object and they have a nice combinatorial or a manifestly positive expression for it. So combinatorially, this is a good formula, but representation theoretically, it's, it's not optimal, but you can remove that factor. And so again, that's very recent and I don't give you the most general results because it's too complicated and I don't want to trouble you with that. So I've just took a one parameter subfamily and here you see this, this, this annoying factor is not there. And this is again, manifestly positive. And so this should be related to some basis of your uh, vacuum space for F fine SL3 for these particular modules. But as I said, I have more general formulas as well. And well, so I'll give you some low level examples. In fact, here I, I cheat a little bit because I said I was only going to do congruence classes. Uh, well, congruent to one modulo three, but not this one isn't, but just to indicate that I have formulas for all congruence classes. Well, at least all congruence classes that are, uh, well, only plus or minus, I, I should say not, uh, things that are divisible by three, they're still an issue, but for the other two congruence classes, everything is fine. And we have explicit identities that should be related to bases of the vacuum spaces. But, and that's really where uh, I should stop. It's really now over to, to actual representation theorists. So that's not me to actually use these results to start constructing bases, right? For these appropriate uh, modules. I think that's still uh, a major open question. Um, and, and, and hopefully these formulas can help with, uh, with this. So, uh, and that's probably where I, I should stop. So thanks very much. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Let me stop the recording and invite people